as most of you know, my name is Dr. Sharin Tofai, and I am a board certified general surgeon. I love what I do with hernias. And so when the pandemic started, let me sh share this screen. When the pandemic started, uh, I began this webinar. It's a one hour webinar every Tuesday called Hernia Talk. I kind of call it Hernia Talk Tuesdays. And uh, I try and promote it as much as I can on all my different platforms on Hernia Doc. Uh, at Hernia Doc is my uh, tag on Twitter and Instagram. And also on Facebook, you can see me at Dr. Tofi. And then when we're all done, as you know, this will all go on YouTube. And basically, uh, I'm all yours today. Uh, many of you know me from what I do online and the education that I provide and some of the articles that I write and everything that I say uh, about hernias, I kind of have fun with it. Um, I think it's fun, fun and funny. But uh, in addition, many years ago, around 2013, I started a free discussion group for patients that's online. It's open to anyone who wants to register, it's free. And it's called uh, herniatalk.com. And that has right now thousands and thousands of uh, people that are involved on it. They ask questions. I answer some of their questions. We have other surgeons who go on herniatalk.com and answer questions. And it all started because I was getting bombarded with emails and questions from patients um, who may or may not uh, have been able to come and see me in person. And I was answering all of these emails very diligently <laughs> And it was the same question over and over again. And I felt that if one person's asking the question, there must be hundreds that have the same question. So that's how herniatalk.com uh, was born in 2013. It's now a pretty active and currently the only website available for uh, patients as a discussion group that also includes um, doctors involved in the, in the question and answers. And, uh, when the pandemic started back in April 5th, so it's almost five months ago, I decided instead of sitting at home and just uh, gaining weight, <laughs> I should do something that is a little bit more fun and educational since everyone else is sitting at home and gaining weight. So uh, we started, or I started Hernia Talk Live. So you're here with me today. Uh, there's a lot of questions that have been uh, posed uh, throughout these five months that we have not been able to get answered and many uh, that you probably have that would like to be answered by me as opposed to some of our guests and uh, so I'm here I will answer whatever question you like uh, I don't care and now if they're mean I, I will ignore the mean questions but most for the most part no one's been mean um, before we start, I just want to share this with you, something that I thought would be interesting is kind of our, our top uh, most interesting hernia talks in terms of engagement. And that, that was uh, as follows. So if you look at the YouTube views and most importantly, the Facebook live uh, engagement, the ones that had the most um, engagement and the most views were number one, the, the episode with the complex hernia systems guru, that's Dr. Dr. Bruce Ramshaw, uh, who currently is in Tennessee. Second was our most recent one about chronic pelvic pain with our amazing gynecologist, Dr. Thais Alibadi, locally here in Los Angeles. Next was the one with the sports hernia surgeon, that was Dr. Mark Zoland, who practices in New York. Our next most engaged and popular uh, hernia talk episode was the one with the urologist where we talked about all the testicular pain. That's Dr. Paul Turek. And uh, next was the um, ones with all the different abdominal wall hernia reconstruction surgeons. So Dr. Jacob, Dr. Brian Jacob from New York, Dr. Igor Belyansky from uh, Maryland and Dr. Vedra Augenstein from North Carolina. They were the top three. Then it was the Schuldeis Clinic surgeon, um, Dr. Spencer Netto, who uh, is in Canada. 
And finally, uh, one of our more recent ones, Dr. David Earl, who was also uh, started that worked in the FDA and gave us some really amazing insight uh, with regard to uh, how the FDA works and uh, you know the, the past, present, and future of Baby Mesh. So thank you for those of you that are, that are sending me some appreciative uh, messages. I appreciate that. Let's go to our first question. And that is uh, the question for this gentleman. Um, I know he's asked it of many others in the forum. Uh, and his question is this. Many of us are frustrated and confused on how someone can tell the difference between an indirect and can you guys all hold on one second? Between an indirect and direct hernia. Many of us want to pursue going to the shoulder hospital only if we have direct hernias and want to avoid going there if we have indirect hernias. That said, what is the percentage probability someone has to find this out, if at all, before being cut open? We all understand Ultrasounds are pointless because they are too operator dependent. Do we just assume the worst that these are direct hernias and go with the overly invasive Shouldice Hospital to err on the side of caution? So I feel that it's really slicing the bread too thin to try and overanalyze the direct versus indirect. You can have a huge indirect or a small direct you can have horrible tissue uh, and all of those would be maybe appropriate or inappropriate um, for tissue repair and or sh specifically a shoulder ice hernia repair. So I get this a lot. I have a lot of patients that come to me and they've done so much research and in their research, they have figured out all these algorithms for themselves, but what they, don't appreciate necessarily is that surgeons like us have our own algorithm and let us do some of the work for you. In other words, uh, don't try and narrow yourself down this one pathway to determine what's the best type of treatment uh, before you see a hernia specialist. There's a reason why we're specialists. We do tailor uh, your findings and your needs um, with the what we recommend. So we may recommend no surgery, we may recommend laparoscopic surgery with mesh or without mesh or um, open surgery with mesh or without mesh. So I would recommend that you do your research, but don't corner yourself into this, oh my God, what am I gonna do if it's a direct and then I chose to do a stroll dice repair. There are tons of surgeons out there, sorry, tons of patients out there where the Shouldice Clinic has performed direct hernia repairs and they're doing just fine. Um, it all depends on the patient and the patient's needs. Now, if you pick a hernia specialist and that specialist says, I think this is the best technique for you. And then in surgery, they decide that they were totally wrong. They found something new in there that's really where it's important, where they may have to change the, the technique or the, uh, the kind of algorithm. And that's why it's so important to find the right surgeon as opposed to kind of pre-decide what you want and then go to the surgeon and say, this is what I want, and then kind of um, maybe not necessarily make the right choice. So I don't believe that a shoulder dice hernia is overly invasive. Um, I think whatever is appropriate for the patient is what's appropriate and to kind of call it an overly invasive repair is not appropriate. Also men and women are different. So their biology or their hernias are different. Um, that's my take on it. Uh, some people may not agree, but I don't know. I think that's my two cents on it. Next question is, is there a doctor close to the East Coast that does what you do? I believe you called one of your guests your East Coast New York twin and you have shared patients, but does he handle complicated cases with mesh reactions and allergies and multiple recurrences asking for a friend? Okay, for your friend, uh, yes, there are and um, for sure. Uh, most of the doctors that I bring on to Hernia Talk 
um, are those that are ones that I would basically, um, can you give me one second? Hold on one second. So what I recommend is um, do seek out surgeons that, that I try and put on hernia talk. I think they're great. You can see their personalities. Do they necessarily want to do everything that, that I do? I don't think so. I also really recommend that you really carefully listen as to what we talk about. So for example, <coughs> if you see a really great surgeon and we don't talk about mesh complications, norectomies, whatever the situation is, that probably means that that surgeon would prefer not to take care of those patients, um, even though they're totally capable of doing it. It's just a, a priority. You know, everyone chooses to have their own type of practice. So the topics that we discuss are usually ones that the surgeon is also very interested to inherit. Um, but if they don't uh, talk about the certain topics, then that's kind of a hint that maybe you should not go to them for that specific type of problem. I hope that's helpful. Okay, is pain aggravation, next question, is pain aggravation with prolonged sitting with relief with standing and walking help distinguish different causes of groin injury, hernia, hip, athletic pubalgia, and sports hernia? Absolutely. So if you think about it, it's very physics-based. If you're standing, coughing, bending, those are all activities that increase abdominal pressure. And if you have pain with coughing, standing, bending, then you may have a hernia, sorry, groin pain, then you may have a hernia because what you're doing is you're increasing abdominal pressure and pushing content into that hole, which is the hernia. Uh, prolonged sitting um, is another one that slightly increases the abdominal pressure and you can actually pinch. What you're actually doing is you're closing off the groin space and pinching into the area. And so when you're pinching it, that can cause uh, pain as well. Uh, if there's content in your hernia. Now, hip injuries usually don't cause pain with standing, but certain types of sitting may hurt because of the angulation of the hip. And then other things can make it worse, such as like going up hills. And uh, we were supposed to have Dr. Snippy today, but he decided that um, he had a lot of patients to take care of today and was saving lives. So. We are rescheduling Dr. Snippy, who is the orthopedic specialist who I admire, who treats a lot of my patients that have hip problems. And when we do have the hip session, we will go into real details as to what specifically is a hip related pain and should be worked up by an orthopedic doctor as opposed to a hernia related pain where it needs to be worked up by someone like me, for example. Um, it's very, very important because those two overlap a lot. And it's really important that the um, that the overlap uh, uh, is one where um, you go to the right, the right people. Okay, next question. Oh, the other question too was about sports hernia. Sports hernia are very different. Those are just only activity related usually and things like sitting and standing and so on. Those, and gravity does not affect, it's mostly um, activity related. Okay, next is another question. Hi, I'm a physio, which I think that means physiotherapist or physical therapist. I have a patient with a banana shaped bulge near her ribs. She has pain with walking more than three to four blocks along with some numbness and tingling. She's worked on improving her thoracic extension and that worked to decrease her pain and numbness and tingling but the bulge is still present. The bulge does not hurt with any other activity. She can do all other activities and no issues. MRI showed bulging discs in the thoracic and upper lumbar spine that would correlate to the peripheral nerve distribution in the area of the banana bulge. The patient had MRI and CT scan, neither showed hernia. Also had, she also had an in-person visit with a hernia doctor. 
I've only seen this client for a video visit. Are there, is there any advice? Could this be an abdominal hernia? So basically, here's a situation. The banana sh shaped bulging in the upper abdomen may be due to a denervation or a weakening of the abdominal wall muscle. And that could be from an impingement of the nerve or any problem related to the um, uh, nerve being impinged. So muscles get their nutrition from the nerve. If there's any injury to the nerve, and that's by the nerve got cut or the nerve the nerve got um, impinged or the uh, nerve is in any way kind of diseased, then that muscle is not going to get any nutrition and then it will lose its strength and its kind of uh, function. So if you're seeing if you're seeing that there is an area where there's a bulging and there's no hernia associated with it, what you usually see is like a diagonal um, bulging. You must work up a back issue. That may be a disc issue or some other nerve problem. And it may be very uncommon to have it a thoracic or upper lumbar disc, but in those patients that, that they present with these uh, um, problems only. So that's the, uh, that, that for sure seems to be right. In other words, the bulging is due to denervation. Now, here's a problem. <clears throat> um, you you want to catch these and treat these before they have permanent muscle damage. Usually within the first three months, that's safe. Even up to six months, that's safe. But longer than that, it's going to take a while for the muscle to re regenerate. So you want to uh, diagnose these nerve damages early. Usually a spine surgeon can help you do that. And then if it is a disc, for example, decompression of that nerve will get rid of um, the muscle dysfunction. <coughs> we'll get rid of the muscle dysfunction and then you'll um, It'll take some time for the muscle to regenerate, but up to a year, and it'll come back. Hope that was helpful. All right, next question. For someone who currently has or previously had a pure tissue repair for a bilateral angle hernia, is it better to urinate frequently with smaller amounts or urinate less frequently with larger amounts? I read comfortably holding off to urinate will strengthen bladder function and allow someone's body to need to urinate less frequently. But on the other hand, will holding urine put more pressure on the hernia, making it worse? So from a hernia surgeon's standpoint, is it better to empty it every chance you get and take a proactive approach in urinating, in urinating to avoid any pressure on the hernia? Okay, for sure, holding on to your urine is not a good idea, whether you have pelvic floor dysfunction or hernia or any other problem. That said, holding on to your urine does not put any pressure on the hernia. So it's not gonna make your hernia worse, but you also don't want to strain to urinate, um, which you can see with some pelvic floor dysfunction. So uh, don't, if you want to strengthen your bladder function by strengthening your pelvic floor, that's a different story. But to kind of urine less, that's a disaster because that can cause a lot of other urinary problems, but it does not affect the hernia itself. Lots of interesting questions, you guys. <laughs> okay, going back to the bulging, um, the, bun the banana, kind of banana bulge, uh, it is diagonal. So that's correct. It's always diagonal because that's the, the nerves are also diagonal. And um, she can do exercises and otherwise the bulge with no pain or symptoms. So yes, uh, that's correct. Whatever you do has to be related to the, to the um, spine and you should not do anything that will affect the, um, uh, it's not a hernia, it's a nerve problem. So exercising and all that has no effect on it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for all your positive comments.
All right, next question. These are coming in really great. I love it. Okay. Except I'm trying to lose my voice. All right. I've been watching, I've been watchful waiting my bilateral ingle hernia for about a year. I want to avoid surgery as long as possible as I've read war stories about people having chronic pain and regretting even having the surgery. I notice it comes out very easily now and one side stays out now 100% of the time. I experience very little pain. Is this causing irreversible damage and compromising my ability for future hernia success? No. So there is no evidence that shows that watchful waiting will in any way compromise your success in another surgery. Now it depends on the type of surgery you want. Most sur United States surgeons offer mesh-based surgery. And if you have a super small hernia or a medium hernia or a large hernia, it doesn't really matter. They all do well with mesh repair. If you have an extremely giant large hernia, and that means like down to like halfway down your thigh or to your knee. And there are hernias that are that big in the groin, believe it or not. Then yes, if you wait until it's that big, you are compromising your options for tissue for hernia repair. Specifically, you're not a good candidate for tissue repair. Now, most people won't be getting tissue repair most likely anyway, so it doesn't matter. But if you're someone who's young, thin, female, or has a lot of uh, uh, disorders that are related to autoimmune, or you have a lot of allergies to things, you may want to consider a tissue repair as opposed to a mesh repair. And if you wait until your hernia is humongous, there's not that much tissue to use to repair. That's why mesh was invented. So uh, no, watchful waiting is perfectly safe. The reality is the majority of patients over time will want the hernia repaired, but short of that, it's totally safe to, to, uh, to do. There's no, no issues with that. All righty. Okay. So those were all the uh, live questions, but as you know, I always come prepared because many of you submit questions um, online because none of, some of you cannot come. I, in fact, I have a couple from outside the country who have submitted their questions. So we're gonna take this time uh, to go through some of those questions unless we have other questions uh, that are coming on live. And I see there's two questions already live, <laughs> okay. All right, let's go through this one. This patient says, I'm allergic to a lot of things. The list is long. What are the most important questions to ask my doctor for hernia repair? Really good question. So I will preface what I say by there's very little data to support what I'm saying. It's mostly based on experience and anecdotal um, evidence. However, if you are allergic to a lot of things, and the, I don't mean things like bananas and strawberries and peanuts. I mean, polyester, you get a rash, um, tons of, of medications, uh, you get really bad reactions to. Uh, there are certain, like, e even, even something like your, like, titanium, what do you call it, uh, nickel allergies, uh, and or you have an autoimmune disorder where you're intolerant of a lot of things, then chances are you may, may, it's not 100%, may have a bad reaction to an implant such as mesh, which is a very common implant we use for hernia repairs. Now, I use a mesh term broadly. Mesh can be synthetic, biologic, a hybrid of the two, low inflammatory, high inflammatory, low weight, high weight, so heavyweight. So when I say mesh, I don't mean all mesh. And when I say implant, I don't mean all implant. And when I say react to, I don't mean you will react 100%. However, there is a risk and that's something you may want to consider asking your doctor. If your doctor poo-poos this and says, mesh is inert, no one reacts to mesh, this is ridiculous, stop reading Google, uh, and you, you legitimately have all these other concerns, then I would seek consultation with a hernia specialist that actually sees mesh reaction patients because it's not a common problem statistically. Numbers wise, there are a lot of patients, I understand that. 
but statistically it's a low percentage. And based on that, most surgeons are not aware of it or do not believe that it exists that you can react to mesh. So if you're getting any pushback, just, you know, it's a free country, go and see another specialist. Most of us nowadays offer telehealth because uh, that is now covered by insurance, whereas before it wasn't. So people that are far away from you can actually visit you virtually on something like this, like Zoom. And then also um, uh, I and some of my colleagues offer uh, online consultation where you can email us all your suggestions or questions. And so based on that, uh, I would recommend that you do seek a consultation and really understand what your per perceived risk would be in terms of having a mesh reaction. And that's what I would, I would specifically ask. You're welcome. Uh, okay, next question, another live question. How far medial can pain related to hip problems extend within the groin? Does medial pain suggest that hip, hip is not the etiology? Yes and no. So if you look at an anatomy picture, the hip joint is actually not where you think your hips are. When most people point at their hips, that's outside where they put their hands, when they, you know, they put your hands on your hip. That's not where your hip joint is. The hip joint is actually many inches inwards towards the middle. It's not all the way in the middle. So people can have groin pain, which is kind of in the uh, up above the groin crease, but in the middle of the thigh uh, area. And that can cause, that can be caused by hip problems because the hip joint is actually deep to that space. Hip Pain can also sometimes cause testicular pain. It's not common, but it can. And we'll discuss a lot of this with Dr. Snibby when he comes back online um, with me for a future hernia attack. We will have orthopedic surgeons and multiple hip surgeons. I'll bring them all in uh, to, discuss, to discuss these questions for you in depth. That's very uncommon to have testicular pain. I've seen it a couple times and some inner thigh pain, but the actual groin pain is often never more than kind of halfway um, in the middle of the of the groin. It's usually not too medial. So you're correct. Usually medial, very medial pain is not consistent with a hip problem. Next question. For someone who had recovered from a pure tissue repair over a year ago, will riding a bike long distance increase the chances of the angle hernia coming back? In other words, is bike riding a high risk activity because if some someone is positioned on a bike seat that creates higher abdominal pressure while your legs are pedaling. No, we do not believe that bicycling is a risk factor for hernia recurrence or hernia occurrence. All activities that are exercise related, including sports and bicycling, are considered protective and not a risk factor for developing hernia. And that also means it's not a risk for hernia recurrence. We don't believe that there's an increase in abdominal pressure um, with cycling because you're actually using a lot of core as part of it and any, anything that involves the core engages the core muscles and does not actually increase abdominal pressure. And then lastly, we discussed this with Dr. Spencer Meadow from the Shouldice Clinic. Uh, the Shouldice Clinic actually has used cycle uh, days zero, one, and two after surgery in their clinic. They have stationary bicycles and they encourage their patients to cycle and that keeps the joint um, mobile. It may decrease scar tissue, improves mobility in this space and may reduce pain after a tissue repair. So if it's good for the shoulder dice, I'm sure it's good for you. Let's see, next question. I had a bilateral angle hernia repair 11 years ago with physio mesh. I've been recently getting pockets of fluid collecting around the mesh site. Ultrasound diagnosed as cysts after workouts or bike riding. Is this common or of concern? Okay, first of all, physio mesh was not made for inguinal hernia repairs. It was made for intra-abdominal placement because it actually has a layer of, of covering that prevents it from sticking to things, specifically the intestine. However, when you're in the groin area, you want the mesh to stick, otherwise you get fluid collections. So not only was physio mesh um, 
not intended to be used in the groin. Wherever it was used, it, did, it was associated with a higher level of uh, seromas or fluid collections. So if you're getting pockets of fluid um, collecting around the mesh, it may be related to the mesh itself because it's, it's actually quite um, low inflammatory in its profile and was made actually not to react too much. And the side effect was that it gets a lot of fluid collection. I mean, I don't know your situation, but it's, if that's indeed the situation and you actually did have physio mesh and you have recurrent seromas, um, then you may want to consider having the mesh removed. Once those fluid pockets uh, develop, then they don't go away. What's not consistent in your, in your history is that your repair was 11 years ago. These seromas occur early on and persist. So you think you had them and then you didn't know until later and they've always been there for 11 years. They should not occur after 11 years. If you're having fluid collections 11 years later, if it's due to the mesh, that's a mesh infection until proven otherwise. If it's not due to the mesh, you may just have a hydrocele, uh, not a cyst. There's no such thing as a cyst after a hernia repair. Okay. One patient. I need someone like that likes to solve complicated problems like yourself. I know. I wish you lived on this side of the world. I think about you all the time, and that's the honest truth. I feel like some of their doctors don't want to get involved in my mess, which is true. Do you find that to be true, that even some qualified doctors don't like to take over a complicated patient that has had multiple surgeries, thankful that you don't mind asking, don't mind taking over someone's mess? Well, unfortunately, yes. I have, I, I know your situation very well, unfortunately. Um, I have reached out to a lot of my surgeons in your part of town who are very, very gifted surgeons, and I trust them a lot. They just don't want to take care of situations that are so complicated. A lot of them are super busy surgeons and feel like they can't give you their time. And they understand that, you know, a lot of them are employed surgeons. Like, I'm not employed. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I can see one patient, I can see 100 patients. No one is on my back telling me what to do. And I choose to take care of complicated patients because you need more of my time. And I have the luxury of giving you my time because I don't have a boss hounding on me saying you need to see 10 more patients today. So unfortunately, that's the situation. I wish I could like be everywhere and help everyone. But I do think about you a lot. I do want to help you. Um, I don't think that we have good choices for you yet. Uh, and I don't like that you're suffering. So uh, I wish you lived closer. Or if I like worked on your on the East Coast, that would have been nice. I should just maybe open up an office on the East Coast. <clears throat> but I do love you very much. All right, you will get better. I promise you. I just uh, hope I can get you better myself. Okay, next question. Could you please explain why a male with a bilateral ingle hernia has one testicle much higher than the other? No pain, but frightening. Seeing the right testicle sits an inch and a half higher than the left side. When I arch my back, leaning backwards, the hernia bulge goes in. However, the testicle lifts even higher. Is this normal and when and what's happening? Okay, so let's discuss um, testicular motion and movement. So a normal testicle must move up and down. It's usually related to temperature and contraction of the muscles, the cremasteric muscle. If the hole through which it moves, which there is a hole, it has to be a hole, it's called the internal ring. If that hole is big, then you're at risk for having a hernia you also are at risk of having a reverse of a hernia, which is not things inside pushing up, but things outside pushing in, which means the testicle can rise up and down much more freely. And some people actually have either a high riding testicle or high rising testicle, or even a testicle stuck in their groin that they often manually reduce down. 
the point I'm trying to make is it's all within normal. It's nothing abnormal if you know you have a hernia. And once you fix the hernia, that should get resolved. If you, because that, that hole is no longer wide open, gaping open for the testicle to move up and down. If you have not been diagnosed with a hernia and your testicle moves up and down, then you should be looked into for a possible hernia, especially if your testicle moves up as high as the groin crease, that's not normal. All righty. We're just running through these questions. I love it. Okay. Here's my friend from Bucharest. So this patient wrote in, I'm in Bucharest and I have a lot of pain from my hernia repair. My doctors do not consider mesh removal. They say my hernia will just come back. Is that a fact? Okay. Yes, that's very true. It's a fact. <clears throat> but there are things you can do for it. That's why we do what we do. So it is true that in Europe, especially in the poorer parts of Europe, so Eastern, mostly the Eastern blocks or the, the areas where there's much more socialized medicine, having a mesh repair alone is like a big deal. And once they do have put mesh in you, they're very reluctant to remove it. One of the reasons is they, their experience with mesh is very limited. In the United States, we've, we have the largest experience with mesh Mesh um, was part is part of the training here, whereas uh, and we have access to a wide variety of mesh. As a result, we also understand where to put mesh and where not to put mesh, and all the risks associated with mesh. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I was invited to go to China, mainland China, Beijing, and Shanghai. It was absolutely one of the best work-related travel I had ever done. They were super nice to us. The food was great and we got to visit with all these different hospitals and we gave all these lectures. <clears throat> At one of the hospitals, they gave lectures to us. And it was a little difficult to understand because they, uh, at one of the hospitals, they had a translator with, for the other one that they didn't, but they were showing these awesome videos of surgeries they were doing and um, the, we were like cringing. We were in the audience front row and seeing, oh my God, this is stuff that we were doing 15, 20 years ago that we've learned never to do, such as put uh, PTFE-based mesh in, in an infected or open wound. Like you just don't do that. That's a disaster. You're going to get hernia, uh, mesh infections and fistulas and so on. And they were showing us how awesome it is what they're doing. And the reality is they just didn't know because they didn't have the experience. They're like about 20, 15, 20 years behind us. So everything we learned 20 years ago, they are now going through that learning process. <clears throat> now we do have, we do publish, we do give talks, but not all of that information is disseminated. And uh, so Going back to this question, the doctors in Bucharest possibly do not consider mesh removal, number one, because they're afraid to do it. They, they then will tell you, you will die or you will be maimed or you will get bowel, bowel injury if we remove the mesh. And they also may not have the technology available to fix the hernia either without mesh using a certain type of abdominal wall reconstruction technology or technique or using like a hybrid or biologic mesh to replace the synthetic mesh or they may not have access to it. They just don't have access to it. We're privileged in the United States in that we do have access to a wide, wide, wide variety of, of um, uh, implants and surgical technology that's not available in a lot of countries. It's partially why our healthcare system is so expensive but at the same time, you're, you're being given access to things that is not available in most countries. You may recall we had a hernia talk session, I wanna say almost two months ago with one of our surgeons in Czech, Czech Republic. And you know she was very frank about availability, they have one type of mesh, that's it. All these other meshes we talk about at these meetings, the Europeans kind of laugh at us because they're like, biologic, what is biologic? Like $10,000 for a piece of, mesh this big, like there's no way that our system would ever 
support that you Americans are all crazy. So they say your hernia, your hernia will just come back. That's probably a fact. If you remove mesh you, in an abdominal wall hernia, not a groin hernia, an abdominal wall hernia, you just try and close it with a tissue repair. It's about a 60% recurrence rate. So it's not 100%. There's a 40% chance you'll do fine. That's better if it's a smaller hernia or you're a thinner patient or you're not, um, don't have a lot of, uh, a, like a large hernia. But that said, in general, uh, what they're saying is correct, but if you go to the right specialist, which may not occur, may not be in Bucharest, I do have one colleague uh, who works there, but I don't know that they do mesh removals. They do kind of complex abdominal wall reconstructions. Um, it may be that what they're telling you may be true in their hands, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, more live questions. I love these. I should do this more often. Who cares about guests? It's all about me answering all these questions. <clears throat> okay, but I do love the love. I love that you share my love, so I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, is there any way to tell beforehand whether a patient has defective tissue requiring mesh versus tissue repair? How do you assess tissue strength intraoperatively if the patient is asleep and cannot cooperate with Valsalva? Okay, <clears throat> by definition, Anyone who has a hernia already has defective tissue. And that's been shown in a lot of pathology studies where they looked at collagen levels and um, mismatch of, of mature versus immature collagen, so the stronger versus the less strong collagen and other kind of genetic markers within the tissue itself. So what will happen is, <clears throat> by, uh, that's why a lot of tissue repairs fail. We believe it's because you're, you're sewing unhealthy tissue to unhealthy tissue. And uh, as a result, the outcomes are not as good unless you have something to support that repair. And we don't really know how long that support is, but we do know that you need it for longer than several years. Is there a way to tell whether the patient has a defective tissue where it won't do well with the tissue repair? No. We can tell if it's really thin versus thick tissue. <clears throat> in the operating room, uh, you can kind of feel if this, the needle goes through it with some turgor or if the needle goes through it like butter, you know, you kind of get a sense of what, what's gonna hold suture or not. Um, it's not a very scientific way of analyzing it, but scientifically it has been analyzed. And we know that tissue that has, that's involved in hernias are collagen deficient in general. Uh, Valsalva is not what's important. It's, it's how well the tissue handles sewing and manipulation. And if it falls apart versus one that actually has good give to it, <clears throat> those are two different things. It's like hair. Like some people have really thick hair, others really fine hair. Um, you don't have to like tear the hair necessarily, but you can kind of see in the way that the hair gets uh, like some people have like uh, hair that's constantly breaking off. Um, some have really thin hair, but a lot of it, thick hair, but very little bit, bit of it. The, the abdominal wall and tissues, you can kind of think of it like that as well. It's kind of like a layman's way of thinking about it. <clears throat> All right. <coughs> Will you consider opening an East Coast office? Or would you be able to, see, to use someone's practice on the East Coast like a partnership or something that will allow you to have a place to perform surgery out here? I most certainly would have my surgery with you if that's foreseeable. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice. I have been offered to come to the East Coast. I've also been offered to come to like the United Kingdom and some European countries to kind of, uh, and actually some Arab countries. Uh, to do stints there. Um, I don't know. I, I'm totally open to it. Um, my only concern is the follow-up because I have a lot of out-of-town patients currently. And for the more complicated ones, I force them to stay around here for a couple of days at least, three or four days. Uh, but, you know, if they're doing well and then all of a sudden they have let's say a complication of, and uh, some of you are out there where you need more help. 
I can help you a little bit from far away, but then you have to come like fly back to see me. So I'm totally open to it. If I feel that there are enough patients that would uh, be willing to see me on the East Coast, um, where would that be though? Maybe not New York, that's like too East Coasty. Maybe Boston? I know that there's like very few of us in the Boston area. Honestly, I'm open to anything. I think uh, I really enjoy what I do. And if traveling will make it so that more of you can be helped by me, I'm totally open to it. I love travel. I speak a lot of languages, so I travel to Europe um, a lot. And um, I tried learning Arabic, that was hard. But my French is pretty good, and so is my Spanish, so Europe is always a good place. I don't know, I'm willing. Let me know what you guys think. I'm happy to consider all of these. But thank you for, the, for, for mentioning that. Uh, seriously, this is the best. Oh, thank you so much. You're always on Hernia Talk. I appreciate your questions. You should offer more of these sessions. Amazingly helpful and thorough in your answers. Jack of all trades, but hopefully a master of my own. Thank you. Another thank you, I appreciate you acknowledging your, my suffering. My quality of life is quite dismal and I'm just getting by, but I'm at wit's end. At my last appointment, her doctor said that the ball is in my court. It's true and I need to figure out what to do. I will be in touch. Please be in touch. I, I do think about you a lot. Try to come up with some ingenious way of helping you out. I kind of may have an idea for you Give me a call, it's a big deal operation, but you may be up to it. Uh, yes, and um, if I do come, maybe DC is a good place because I like that area a lot. And you would give me a pro proper Southern welcome to Virginia, I would absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Um, now that I have your attention, I know it's the end of the session almost, uh, many of you, my friends have listened to Hernia Talk and they've mentioned that the content is quite, quite good. Um, so I'm glad for that. And they have recommended that I snatch the audio from Hernia Talk and make it into a podcast. That way it's readily available for all of you to listen to at your leisure while you're driving or doing housework or gardening or whatever. Uh, and I'm curious if any of you would listen to a podcast of Hernia Talk. I have five months worth of weekly sessions now, and we can continue to do that. So uh, text me, email me, find me on social media. Let me know and be honest. If you think this is like better as a visual thing, um, because you get to see the doctors and it kind of humanizes us a little bit more. And let's not do podcasts because everyone and their mother is doing a podcast, let me know. But if you think that it's something that you'd be worth listening an hour of, um, I'm willing to do that for you, why not? Okay, more questions. The only randomized trial looking at two of the many techniques advocated for sports hernia with Dr. Pa Johnin being the lead author, found TEP repair as well as minimal repair were highly successful. How can lap mesh repair only for sports hernia and athletic pubalgia if due to pubic plate injury? Yeah, you know, we discussed this question with Dr. Zoland. He was not a proponent of doing a lap repair for a sports hernia. And I would like to say that He's probably right because a posterior repair doesn't necessarily offload tension from an anterior injury. And unfortunately, at least from what I've seen in my experience, there's a lot of surgeons that call small hernias that they don't feel a sports hernia, which is not. And then they, of course, do a hernia repair <laughs> for that small hernia. And guess what? Patient gets better. And so they say that's an appropriate repair. So I wonder how much of what you've read um, is really surgeons just doing a bona fide hernia repair or a, 
what I call a cult hernia. It's a lot of what I do because it's more common among women. And then, then they think they're patting themselves on the back because the pain goes away, but in fact, they just have to just repair the hernia. So it was a misdiagnosis the whole time. Last question, I think. No, we got some more time. You've made a great point for someone looking for a tissue repair to focus on a hernia specialist who is versatile in adjusting to what your needs are versus being set on a specific surgery beforehand. So which East Coast surgeons would you suggest are stand out at being versatile with tissue repairs? Well, we've already had several. Dr. Eunice was one who does a lot of tissue repairs um, and a wide variety of them. He would be a good choice because he actually likes doing tissue repairs. The other surgeons that we um, spoke to on Hernia Talk, like Dr. Jacob, do tissue repairs as well as laparoscopic repairs. So he's another good one. Um, Dr. Zolan as well. There, you know, the people I bring on are all people that I, I recommend. Um, and if you hear us talking on Hernia Talk about a tissue repair, then know that they do tissue repairs. I would not bring up that topic if I didn't know that that was something of interest to them. Uh, I appreciate your answer, but this was sophisticated study with MRI control. Right, so MRIs are notoriously misread. If you look at my papers about MRIs, um, almost all of them, I would say three out of four were misread for occult ingle hernias. So, uh, and many of them, many patients have tendinopathy, but that's not the reason for their pain. It's actually an undiagnosed ingle hernia. So in a sophisticated study, with actual hernia surgeons that, that um, read their own MRIs or are working with radiologists that will be able to understand that the MRI, whether it shows a hernia or not, in those patients, um, I think a lot of them are confounded by the fact that they're just fixing hernias. All righty, thank you so much. Another one, I've learned so much through your talks, posts, et cetera. Without suggesting an occult hernia, none of the specialists I've seen would have considered it. Currently speaking with a general surgeon who is along the lines of, well, I guess I can pop in a scope and look. Okay, let me talk about that. The rest of your question um, refers to years of deep pelvic pain, hypermobility, and just a had a positive ultrasound for an ingle hernia but that's more superficial than my pain. Your info is so encouraging and made me realize I'm not crazy or making this up. Yeah, for sure you're not crazy. I'd say this all the time. Uh, patients do not want to have pain and they don't really, I'm sorry, you can't have a patient that comes up with a perfect anatomic lie about their pain. You know, if it makes sense anatomically, then you gotta believe them. You can't just say it's in their head or they're, or they're making it up because that just shows your weakness, I think, as a surgeon. So um, be very careful about surgeons who want to go in and pop a scope and look. I've never had to do that. And by never, I mean maybe once or twice in my 20-year career uh, where the patient was just in so much pain and every other study was negative. An imaging, good imaging study and a good history and a good physical, those three combined will be able to diagnose almost everything that you need diagnosed and therefore determine your plan of care. Now, let's say you're in a situation where your surgeon doesn't know what else to do and is offering to take a look. Very specific to an occult hernia is they are occult, which means they are hidden, which means putting in a scope or camera, laparoscope, will not show you that hernia, most likely. What they have to do is go beyond just putting a scope in, actually physically take down the peritoneum level and the fat that's plugging your hole. Look at the actual muscle and see if there's a hernia there. If there isn't, then you have your answer. But if there is, that's the only time when you can tell. <clears throat> what I see often happens is the surgeon goes in there, pops a camera, no hernia, whereas they did have a hernia just beyond the tissue that they're looking at. And what they then have years and years and years of not being treated for a very treatable inguinal hernia. And it was just missed. 
And because they felt so confident about the surgical approach, uh, they didn't know that, that, that they were uh, basically misdiagnosed from the very beginning or misled. So if you do go under surgery, make sure, make sure, make sure that the perineum is taken down and the fat in the inguinal canal is removed and they look at the actual hernia at the muscle level, not the intraperitoneal level, before they say you do not have a hernia. And honestly, I'm available to your surgeons. Please, if you feel like your surgeon would like to call me or talk to me or ask me a question or get some advice, I am always available. They know how to reach me. Please just have them do that if you feel like that's gonna help you out. And I know that most of you can't physically come to see me, even though I would love to treat all of you. And thank you for thinking that I'm an amazing combination of expertise, science, compassion, and kindness. I do really appreciate that. Um, uh, looks like there's some interest in the podcast. I will do my best to look into it and see how, I don't, I don't wanna put bad quality content out there. So if it's something that's good quality, then for sure I will do that for you. And that is the end of Hernia Talk. Thank you everyone for joining me on another Tuesday. We have another excellent guest next week on Tuesday, 4.30. I will post our session here on uh, YouTube and share the link with that on herniatalk.com, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And for those of you that couldn't get to see me on Facebook Live, this, I'm very apologetic. Sometimes Zoom is not the best in, in getting uh, its collaboration with Facebook. But I do thank you so much and hope you have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye.